Jousting was a popular sport in the France of the 1500s. Attended by royalty, jousting tournaments pitted muscular men, thundering horses, and clanking armor in mock battles. And this dangerous sport often turned lethal. King Henry II was an active participant in these contests. But in 1559, the king was mortally injured in a jousting accident and died in agony. The royal family he left behind included a seven-year-old son, who was to become Henry III. The king's death left the boy's manipulative mother, Catherine de' Medici, in control. But the tragedy was no surprise to Catherine. It had been foretold by this man, Nostradamus, Catherine's famous astrologer. He had predicted her husband's accident in bloody detail. Catherine believed in the occult and sought another prediction from the revered seer. Nostradamus provided a double-edged prophecy concerning Catherine's favorite son, Henry. Although he wasn't the next in line to the throne, Henry would rise to be king. But once king, he would bring shame to the throne of France and an end to his dynasty. Blinded by a mother's love for her favorite son, Catherine ignored the warning that the prophecy would come to pass. Catherine dominated Henry and controlled her court by resorting to witchcraft and poisoning. In an unsettled time when France was torn by bloody religious conflicts, Henry grew up shadowed by the sinister prediction and surrounded by court intrigue. Henry's older brother became King Charles IX in 1560. But the overbearing Catherine wanted Henry to have his own kingdom, so she managed to have 21-year-old Henry installed as King of Poland. Catherine was delighted, but it was a nightmare for Henry. Forced to leave an opulent Parisian life, Henry took an instant dislike to Poland. He found his subjects uncivilized, the climate unbearable, the food revolting. Henry sent homesick letters to his beloved mistress, Marie de Condé, back in Paris, using his own blood as ink. I'm dying of boredom to see you again. Nothing can console me or make me forget what I have lost in not having you here with me. But in May 1574, Catherine ordered Henry to hurry home. His brother Charles had died and the throne was his, just as Nostradamus foretold. It was rumored Catherine poisoned Charles herself to get Henry back to Paris. Henry was glad to quit his Eastern Kingdom, but he had to give his Polish nobles the slip so he summoned them to a sumptuous banquet where he feasted them with spiced meats and vats of alcohol. When his guests fell asleep, Henry donned a disguise and ran away. The nobles woke to find their king had disappeared. Relishing his freedom, Henry's eccentric behavior began to surface. Instead of shouldering his responsibility as King of France, Henry led his entourage to decadent Venice for an extended party. Here, Henry discovered a different world, full of colorful bazaars and exotic masked balls. Succumbing to his sensual yearnings, Henry experimented with sexual ambiguity dressing up and exploring erotic possibilities. It led him to contract syphilis. But the party stopped when Henry ran out of money and had to return to his mother Catherine and France. When Henry returned home, he received news his longtime love, Princess Marie de Condé, had died. Deeply affected, he suffered an emotional breakdown the King of France would never be the same again. 
The grieving king locked himself in a room of the Louvre Palace, refused food and drink, and allowed access only to the royal tailors. Henry raised court eyebrows when he emerged several days later sporting a black velvet suit embroidered with human skulls rather than traditional mourning clothes. If Venice brought out Henry's sensual side, Murray's death triggered a macabre twist in his character. Catherine was anxious for her son to marry and produce an heir. So the morose Henry dutifully followed his mother's wishes and married a timid and subservient woman with little social standing. To raise the king's spirits, his mother moved the court to the south of France. Ignoring his new wife, Henry remained morbid and became involved in the religious flagellants cult. Barefoot and dressed in sackcloth, the group paraded through the streets, beating themselves bloody with whips. Fascinated by the cult's piety and sensuality, Henry, wearing a necklace of skulls, forced his wife and mother to participate. Catherine tried to curb her son's excesses and encouraged him to produce an heir. But the King of France was sexually ambiguous and perhaps sterile because of his venereal disease. Henry was more interested in his bizarre pursuits than in producing an heir, and he was virtually unique among kings in not fathering a single royal bastard. Returning to Paris, the eccentric Henry's behavior took another bizarre turn. Shirking the responsibilities of a ruler, the king gathered a group of young male courtiers, contemptuously known as the Mignons, his sweeties. Nicknamed Princes of Sodom by an outraged Parisian press, the beautiful, athletic young men paraded in public, plastered in rouge and dripping with jewels. Dressed in a woman's bodice, cuddling poodles, the King of France led his sweeties through the streets of Paris. Even at manly jousting events, Henry and his friends dressed up in flamboyant, effeminate finery. Sparing no expense, the King showered his young favorites with lavish gifts, from pet monkeys to jewel-encrusted costumes. As one observer noted, one did not know whether it was a woman king or a man queen. These fine mignons, with their painted faces and long hair, are like the whores in the brothel quarter. Their frilled ruffs are over half a foot wide, and when you see a head sticking out above the pleats, you could mistake it for the head of John the Baptist on Salome's platter. The mignons constantly fought among each other to be close to their patron, the king. Excellent swordsmen, they resolved their jealous conflicts with duels. During one sword fight, Henry's favorite mignon, the Comte de Caillou, was seriously wounded. The concerned king closed an entire street so the injured young man could recover in peace. But the man died. The devastated king insisted on honoring his friend with a state funeral and always kept a lock of the fallen favorite's hair. In the fight for power, intrigue and murder became an everyday occurrence at Henry's increasingly debauched court. To guard against plots, the king recruited 45 brutal bodyguards from among the Mignons and used them to settle old scores. The king heard two enemies, the Duc de Guise, charismatic leader of fanatical Catholics, and his brother, a cardinal, were plotting against him. Henry summoned ten guards, gave them daggers, and then looked on as they cut down the Catholic leader. Two days later, the cardinal was also assassinated for which King Henry III was excommunicated and stood damned in the eyes of the church. At a time of religious strife, the king had further alienated the powerful conservative Catholics. It would come back to haunt him. By his thirties, Henry's dissolute lifestyle was taking its toll. Serious bouts of the debilitating syphilis he picked up in Venice began to prematurely age the young king. 
Exotic lotions could not restore his lost teeth, his missing hair, his sexual appetite. Increasingly depressed, Henry abandoned his flamboyant wardrobe for more somber clothes. Henry's physical decline coincided with political turmoil. As religious war broke out, Paris fell into the hands of the fanatical Catholics. Long at odds with the church, Henry was forced to flee his own capital. In exile from Paris, unprotected by guards, Henry was in his bedroom one night when a zealous Catholic monk broke in. Angered by the king's past decadent behavior, the monk stabbed Henry to death. Henry III's life fulfilled every aspect of the Nostradamus prophecy. His body was embalmed and sealed in a traditional lead coffin. But Catholic fanatics still controlled Paris and refused to let the king be buried at the traditional royal resting place here in the Cathedral of Saint-Denis. Henry's corpse lay forgotten in a monastery for 21 years until he was finally laid to rest in the cathedral. Bizarrely enough, the eccentric monarch lies sealed inside a marble casket on top of a strangely carved column. And all that remains is Henry's embalmed heart. <laughs>